Good afternoon. Today is the 3rd of July and as promised we're going to be answering some of your viewer questions. Now I've had some sensible questions and I've had some frankly absurd questions. Some of them that uh, were put in the comment section below aren't actually questions so we're not going to answer those today. I've already dealt with them if I've replied to the comment so we will just go with things that are actually questions. I do like the absurd questions by the way and I think some of else of you do too so we will continue to uh, you know answer those but uh, first of all we'll go with something a bit more sensible. Start with Richard Howlett. If I do get anybody's name wrong um, then I really apologize. So Richard asks um, what is your music radio station of choice while driving? When you're not talking to us, of course. <laughs> wow, that's very kind, sir. Um, I've got Roxy Music in the CD Auto Changer with U2, Bruce Springsteen, Imelda May, etc. Radio 2 or Talk Sport. I don't really listen to the radio, to be honest, uh, anymore, which is one of the reasons why I would like to get a different system in my Rover 45. Um, one of my friends is hopefully going to be uh, fitting a new one at the weekend. I listen to um, a lot of music by um, contemporary Christian worship artists because I used to actually be on the core team for a Christian music festival, but you didn't know that. I uh, well, Yes, I helped to manage one of those for about four years, which was in the sort of mid-2010s, and um, the top three of those I listened to I actually know all these, all these people uh, would be uh, Sean Foyt, uh, Jason Upton, and Jonathan David Helser. They're very, very good. You probably would have even seen uh, sort of some of these things appearing on uh, on various screens. I've got Bluetooth on the phone um, during some of um, the videos that I've done. Um, sometimes I listen to other stuff though. I like James Bond soundtracks. Particular favourite is on the Magic Secret Service. I also have a very um, beloved uh, album which is called The Music of ITC Volumes 1 and 2. I think that was a double CD when it was introduced. And uh, there is a fantastic thing on Spotify, which is Howard Blake's Avengers 1968-9 playlist. Howard Blake, who I think wrote music for The Snowman, actually, amongst some other things. He was um, brought in by Laurie Johnson in the final series of Avengers in 1968 to score episodes up until... Um, I think the last one he did was probably who was that man? Who was that man I saw you with, which was January '69. He did a very, very good job actually, and I'm very, I mean, a big fan of his music. Um, so yes, that's the sort of variety I listen to. I mostly use Spotify and streaming and things like that. Next question we have is from Jason Laser Capri. I was asked this question some time ago. What car would you pick uh, between 1970 and 1980? It has to be an Aston Martin, Rolls Royce, or a Bentley. Uh, the model, the engine, and why. I did struggle with this, but uh, I went with Aston Martin DBS 1970 in a grey of a 3.9 litre. I have to agree with the Aston Martin DBS from 1970 in gunmetal grey. Being a fan of things like On a Magic Secret Service of the Persuaders, I can't really argue with that. I wasn't so keen on the facelift that they did to the DBS in 1972 to make it into just a V8 which is the car a few years down the line that you see in the living daylights. I prefer the look of the original DBS but personally I would go with the V8 model, I wouldn't go with the 3.9 or 4 litre, I would go with the V8 model which is what the car in the Persuaders is supposed to really be although it is actually a six cylinder car. Um, Rolls Royce and Bentley of the area, they're, they're good cars, but nothing really compares, <laughs> obviously, with uh, the Aston Martin DBS. Next question comes from Nicholas Owens. I'm sure over the years you have many tricks and tips for looking after cars. I would like to see a video like that, such as I found a great place to get a key fob replaced in batteries less than the £250 extortionate figure. Um, quote at the dealers or simple tips like cutting a two litre bottle of lemonade um, in half having drunk the contents of course and using the top half as a funnel with the cap removed. I'm very happy to do a video on this. I don't think I'm really the right sort of person to be able to bring you 
the most tips in this kind of way. I would have thought Mr. Coleman's your man with this kind of thing in terms of um, how to run a car and save money, but maybe we'll do that in the future if uh, you would like me to do so. Please do leave your comments below. Next question is from Colin Hicks. This one's question, the short answer might be no. Mr. Ian Seabrook, or Pubnut, is an advocate of electric cars. Mr. Richardson from Furious Driving is an advocate of hydrogen fuel cell cars. Would it be possible, with you as a moderator, to put together a three-way call where they could have a very good argument, sorry, serious reasoned discussion, where they put their points of view across? I wish I'd thought of this when we were all bored at home in lockdown. Well, some of us still are bored at home in lockdown, to be honest. Um, yeah, we'll skip over that. Um, it might have been easier then. Well, I, I don't know. I, I will ask Mr. Richardson. Um, he is very good friends with Mr. Seabrook and see if that's going to be a possibility. I, I don't know if it is. Ian Seabrook seems to be quite busy on his little collection of cars that he's not had a chance to play with for ages and, uh, you know, improving them with varying degrees of success or failure. So I don't know if that's going to be possible, but, you know, we'll see. Next question is from Ilias Lamari. Dear Joseph, I live in the Netherlands where the classic car status has been changed since 2014. Before 2014, every car that turned 25 years old got classic car status. That meant three road tax and, and an MOT every two years as opposed to once a year. The rules nowadays since 2014 are that your car needs to be at least 40 years old to be tax-free. Well, that's similar to um, the situation we have in this country, although you, uh, you are MOT exempt as well. If it is already 25 years old, but still not 40 years old, you have to pay full tax charges for LPG and diesel vehicles. Petrol cars can get a massive reduction, 75%, that's a big reduction, it's called the quarter charge if they sawn the car in November, December and January. Not allowed to use them for these months if you want the tanks reduction. Okay, fair enough. If you had to buy a classic car here that's at least 25 years old or older for around €2,000, what would it be? It has to be an affordable second car. So would you go for a quarter, a quarter charge car as well it needs to be from before 1988. Don't ask me why the Dutch government is weird sometimes. Well, that's not the only government that's weird, is it, to be honest? So, quarter charge car, 40-year-old car, or maybe cheap old LPG and diesel car. These are classics here now uh, with very low resale value because of a high road tax. And why, which brand, year, model, and engine? Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of questions there. Um, I'm going to go... With a car that I know was sold in the Netherlands, they're probably not very common over there now, but I don't think they'd be necessarily that expensive. I'm going to go with a 1987 Rover um, SD3 T16 EFI Vitesse. They're not actually that expensive as classics go. Um, that's a facelifted uh, SD3, and I really, really like those. I've you know, I wanted to get one of those on the channel for ages, but they're not particularly common. They don't char they don't cost a lot of money when they come up. So I think that um, would satisfy most of the most of the criteria. They're not that expensive to run, they're pretty easy to work on. They've got their problems such as absolutely chronic rust. But you you tell me a sort of nineteen eighties family car that doesn't suffer from absolutely chronic rust if it's been left outside, you know, most of them tend to anyway, so um, if you can find one of those, then that might be a good idea. R34 says, what do you think of the new Ineos Grenadier? Well, from what I've understood from reading articles in the press about this and just seeing videos of this, I don't think they've even revealed the interior of that car yet. It's not going to be on sale for a couple of years, and it reminds me of the old Santana PS10 which was a licensed built Land Rover, but with all the copyright infringing features removed. 
Santana built Land Rovers in Spain from I think the 1950s to 1983. And so the Series 1, 2 and 3 Land Rovers built in Spain, which were exported to many other parts of the world, looked exactly the same as the ones we got over here. There were some slight differences, but they um, they looked pretty much the same. In 83, the, the license expired, so they never got the um, sort of what called the county facelift. It wasn't called the Defender until about 1990, actually, the Land Rover. It was called more of a sort of a county and things like that. So... Um, the Santana looked a bit different after that, and the PS10 was kind of the last type of Santana they built, and um, they actually made it as well for Iveco as the Iveco Massive. So uh, that was a car on sale in this country in the kind of mid to late 2000s. I don't remember seeing too many of them, but they were around. And the Ineos Grenadier just looks to me like a slightly more modern Santana PS10. Land Rover themselves have been unable to copyright the shape of the old Defender. So this is why you have things like the Iveco Massive, Santana PS10 and the Ineos Grenadier now, which all kind of look a bit like a Land Rover Defender but aren't quite. I don't know how much it's going to be. I'm, I'm not really sure. Maybe £50,000? The uh, Defender is something I've seen. I saw it actually at the Goodwood Revival last year when I was uh, there at Planet Auto, who very kindly allowed me to go along with them. And I don't know really what I quite make of it. I haven't seen it in real life. I don't know whether to be, uh, you know, to be excited about it or not particularly. It's not a car that produces a strong emotion in me as it does in a lot of other people. I think it's the same with this. It's not particularly my sort of car one way or the other whether or not it's better than the new Defender I, I couldn't say just by looking at some pictures and knowing that it's going to be partially assembled in Britain and Bridge End and um, with some BMW engines that that could be really bad it could be really good I really really couldn't say but it's, it's nice to see that it will actually at least partially be, a bit, be built in Britain and, and it does have more of a rugged look to it than the Defender now we get to what is always in these question and answer sessions the most rambling questions of all from Trabali. But he and I both love doing this, and there's several of these now if you want to go and see what his other ones were. So let's get on with it then. Okay, so now you're back in Britain. You have now reached superstar status after rescuing Brigitte Bardot. The French have given you the Legion d'honneur, and the British have given you an OBE for your services. You are on the front cover of Time magazine, Vogue magazine, and even the free weekly Eastleigh Echo. Yeah, there was there was um, there was an, a, an Echo in this area. Now I'm not actually sure if it's here um, anymore these days. I haven't seen it in a while, but yeah, there definitely was a, a free paper round here called the Echo. You rub shoulders with stars and have been married and divorced a number of times to actresses, models, and singers in the course of the next six years. I don't think that would happen in real life, I'm afraid, and um, I won't show my lady wife this just in case anyway. Um, so everything's fine until, well, not really fine if you've had several divorces anyway, but um, it's good until disaster. Whilst filming in the Clyde in Scotland for The Spy Who Loved Me, this would place it in 1976 actually, so we're a little bit out because the last challenge was in 69, so we're a little bit out, but we'll say we're in 1976 and we're filming in Scotland. Albert Broccoli and Lewis Gilbert have been taken by the Russians, not them again. Apparently they didn't like the plot of the film. Well, you know, you can kind of understand that, can't you? You have to pursue the thieves of the film producer and director across Europe, Britain, France, West Germany, East Germany and Italy. Question, which period correct native cars of the UK, France, West Germany, East Germany and Italy would you choose to chase them in each country? Good luck, sir. I had to actually look this up. It was quite a quite a task. This um, first of all, but no question at all of what we have in this country. We um, we get hold of I think his name is Roger Becker. He was the test driver for Lotus and uh, get him to drive us down um, from Scotland to I presume Dover if we're going to France um, in the Esprit, the, the same Esprit but probably hanging around at the back of a set PPW306R because he is the Lotus test driver and he did the stunts in Sardinia in The Spy Who Loved Me. So we want one of those and we want him to drive me down there. I'm pretty sure I'm rich enough now after 
after after being famous and all this kind of thing. When we get to um, when we get to Calais, we're going to have to switch though, and uh, the brand new Peugeot 604 with a PRV uh, engine and is waiting for me there. Um, hopefully that won't break down. They weren't the most reliable engines in the world, but we've not really got too many um, cars in France at that time that aren't powered by the PRV engine, that are very, very powerful. So we'll go with the 604 because it's rear wheel drive and nice and comfortable. In West Germany, we're gonna switch for the Mercedes-Benz W116 450 SEL 6.9, as used that year in 1976 by, um, I think his name's Claude Delouche, um, for Citizen Rendezvous in Paris. Um, also in Ronin, of course, no question at all, we're going to have one of those and just hope that the fuel doesn't really disappear as quickly as it can. Obviously, if you've got a 6.9 litre engine, it's going to drink fuel pretty quickly. In East Germany, we're going to have to switch over to something um, a bit more subtle. There's really only two cars that are native to, to, to East Germany at the time. There's the Trabant, which is going to be hopeless, and there's the Wartburg. And that only has a one litre engine, but, you know, it's just what we have. Um, we might be very lucky and get one of the post-75 models of disc brakes. So uh, we'll go into Wartburg uh, 353. In Italy, we can do a bit better. We can go for another sort of type of Bond car. And we can go for the Alfa Romeo Alfetta GTV 2 litre, brand new 1976. Not quite as nice and fast as the 2.5 Busso you see in Octopussy. But, you know, not bad, nevertheless. So I hope that answers your question. Next question from Mr. Andy G. My question to you, Joseph, is out of all the cars you've mentioned in the, the cars of um, film and television series, is there an absolute favourite car for you? Yes, there is. I think I answered this last time, actually. Um, but I've, I've given a bonus one in here as well. The 1968... Lancia Fulvia Coupe in Department S is the, my favourite of all the cars we've mentioned. I've really wanted one of those since, excuse me, really wanted one of those since seeing the Fulvia Coupe on an episode of Deals and Wheels, I think in the year 99 or 2000. Always wanted one of those. Um, so yes, there's no, no, no doubt about it. They were as expensive as the Jaguar E-Type in Britain at the time. So yes, very fancy cars indeed. The backup would be a 1982 Ford Granada 2.8 injection saloon. It's sort of known as an injection sport, but strictly just injection. But you see it ashes to ashes, it's like a sort of grey colour with a red pinstripe. I really like that for some reason. I don't know quite know why. So I love the Granada Mark II, but that injection sport is very, very, very nice indeed. Final question comes from BTCC. What do you think of the MG ZT 260 and the Rover 75 V8? These were cars which were completely pointless. They didn't really help MG Rover at all when they were launched in 2003. The Rover looks very imposing with its enormous grille. And the engineering of them is such that they don't really share many parts underneath with the normal 75s. They have different gearboxes, different engines, different drive shafts. The car is now rear wheel drive as opposed to front wheel drive. Absolutely bonkers and, you know, really no reason to exist other than that they have a bit of prestige and the same engine and transmission went into the MG X, uh, X Power SV. But I would like to very much drive one, particularly the Rover 75 V8. I'm far more interested in Rovers than I am MGs. Well, much as I like MGs, Rovers are just what I prefer. So, yes, I think they're great. They're completely bonkers, and they're, these days, rather expensive. There's not many around, but, yes, definitely like to drive one of those, absolutely. So I hope you found that, that uh, video to be in informative. Thank you very much indeed for all your questions. I hope they were answered to your satisfaction. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. To like this video, leave a comment below. Uh, visit my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Lloyd Vehicle Consulting, Instagram.com forward slash Lloyd underscore vehicle underscore consulting, and uh, see you again soon, I think.